Now, there are four examples I want to talk about. In fact, in, um, there's a lot more that I'd like to talk about in the next three or four hours, but I'm not going to talk that long, so that's good. Uh, I, but I think I'll refer to a few just to give you a sense and hopefully provoke some of you in one way or another. Uh, so I'll talk about sex education, I'll talk about missile defense, intelligent design, and you know, I'd like to talk about global warming because I'm sure I'd like to uh, refute things that may have been said in this very room, in fact. Uh, and I, I, I will be happy to talk about it in the question period, but in order to keep my remarks down, I've decided to remove that because that's an issue we've heard a lot about in one way or another. And I want to just present these because there are three very different examples of fuzzy thinking, in my opinion. Thinking which if, if we thought, like scientists should think, a lot of these issues would at least, I think, be clear, or the important things that should be the basis of public policy would be clear. And I want to make that, very, that statement very important at the, uh, right at the outset. Scientists should not be making public policy. But policymakers should be informed by science. And that's the important thing. So let's pick an example, which is abstinence-only education, which has been around mandated in one form or another since 1996 in this country. I would call it faith-based science, and I don't, by faith-based, I don't mean religious. Okay, it's based on the faith that somehow abstinence-only education will help. And uh, this has been monitored. In particular, the, the Center for Disease Control ran a program that was called Programs That Work. And, and they analyzed and tried to do studies of sex education programs that worked in the schools. And they focused on five programs, if you read their website in 2001 that were found effective in scientific studies and sex education. None of those at the time, by the way, involved abstinence only. Importantly, and, and of great concern to a number of us, in 2002, the Programs That Work initiative was ended. And all the information that had been gleaned on sex education programs was removed from that site. And one of the reasons it was removed is that, is that abstinence only became the policy of our government. Now, in fact, in our, the next year, Ari Fleischer stated, Abstinence is more than sound science. It has a proven track record. At the time, it wasn't clear where it was proven. But more recently, it's been quite proven to the contrary. A, a very large study was just done in April 2007 following kids for 10 years, 2,000 children. And a number of conclusions were, were drawn. First of all, students who took abstinence-only courses were no more or no less likely to abstain from sex than other students. Absence only did not change the likelihood of condom usage. It did not make it worse, which some people have claimed, to be fair. And the, the, the conclusion of the study was, the most effective programs are those that say abstinence is the best choice, misspelling, but birth control and protection are also worth knowing about. Okay, not, not too surprising, perhaps. That was in April 2007. Okay, this should tell us something about what we fund. Congress in October 2007 agreed to increase money for absence-only education by 28 million. We now spend a total of about 200 million dollars a year for a program with no scientific basis. In the United States, we should remember, we have the highest teenage pregnancy rate in the developed world, about the same as Ukraine's, it turns out. The highest abortion rate in the Western world. Sexually transmitted diseases like syphilis and gonorrhea are on the rise for the first time since the 1980s. I mention this because I find this unbelievably offensive. I have a daughter, among other things. And the thought that some a priori notion about what we should be doing is more important than doing something that could save the lives and health and well-being of our children is something that sickens me. Let me now move to a, uh, another subject, missile defense. As you know, missile defense has actually been around for a long time. And it's a good idea. I mean, President Reagan proposed that we, you know, we, pr the scientific community created nuclear weapons, and why not create a, well, a method to make them obsolete? And, um, uh, and if you, I wrote about Star Trek. I'm contractually obliged to mention it. Any good starship on Starship, uh, you know, on, on Star Trek always has a, has a shield. It's a great idea if you can make it. It's absolutely a good idea if you can make it. And you argue that, you know, given the, and it's important, given where we are, the spirit of American enterprise, nothing is impossible. Now, in fact, I would argue that the notion that nothing is impossible is also runs counter to the way science is, is, is really framed. Science is all about what's impossible, as I told you. 
What's possible we don't know, but what's impossible we often do. And missile defense is an area where scientists in particular have, have spoken out a lot over the years about the difficulties and, the, and particularly the logical in inconsistencies with missile defense. One of, the, you know, one of the examples that's often used when we talk nowadays in this presidential campaign, you'll hear people say about the spirit of American enterprise and how we were able to send a man to the moon. We could do anything. Well, the important thing was, was pointed out by at least one person is the moon didn't try and stop us. <laughs> if it had moved five feet, that would have been a disaster, okay? And when we're trying to engage in missile defense, we're actually going to be trying to defend ourselves against missiles, which, and presumably the people who are sending the missiles at us actually don't want us to hit the missiles. And that's an important issue, which I probably won't have time to get in, enough time to get into today. It's one of the main things that concerns physicists, is the fact that in general, offensive weapons are much cheaper to build than defensive weapons, and in fact, this can be proliferating. But I don't want to get into that subject that much because you might say that's controversial. I want to talk about something else which shouldn't be controversial. And in 2002, the American Physical Society, which represents scientists of all political persuasions from this country and elsewhere, proposed a, a radical, made a radical statement, a revolutionary statement. They passed a resolution calling on the government to delay deployment of a missile defense system until it was de demonstrated to be workable against a reasonable threat. So they said, don't deploy it till it works. What a novel idea, okay? Now, in fact, it turned out that more than 50% of the US public already thought we had a missile defense system in place at the time, <laughs> maybe the same 50%. I would argue that, in fact, that, that, that we should have kept that and not spent the money. I mean, just saying we had one in place <laughs> is as good as having one that doesn't work. In fact, better. Uh, in 2003, our administration officials told the Senate that interceptors capable of shooting down enemy missiles with a 90% efficiency would be in place by September 2004. Okay. In spite of the fact that the systems that had been built failed in uh, a majority of the tests that had been performed at that time, and none of the tests, in fact, evolved, involved realistic decoys or any of the uh, um, things one would expect anyone that was shooting a weapon at us would use. Uh, but we decided by fiat that the, this system would be, would be workable and in place. Now, what are you going to do if you're the Pentagon and you're told that a system's going to be in place by 2004 when it's failed the tests? Well, quite simply, it was, well, it's, the easiest thing to do is stop testing. So that's what the Pentagon did. After that statement, the Pentagon stopped all testing of missile defense systems, because after all, they'd been failing much of the time, until the system was deployed. Now I ask you, we're allowing our government to do that. Let's just think of private enterprise for a moment. Would it be acceptable for General Motors to begin marketing a new SUV when trials have shown that 60% of the time it toppled over when turning a curve at greater than 50 miles per hour? Well, maybe we'd let General Motors do that. But would it be acceptable, say, in your neighborhood to build a nuclear power plant if, if in the prototypes there was a 60% failure rate? Would we allow that? I mean, and, and the point is, this is just going to kill a few people. This may take out just a city. But we're talking about our national defense. We're talking about the f defense of this country, and now we're talking about the defense of other countries. And we're willing to allow the kind of sloppy thinking to deploy a system that doesn't work and claim it does. We're allowing our government to do things that we never allow, in my mind, private industry to do. Now, it was declared operational in September 2004. And you may remember in the campaign, we were told that, that, that we, it was operational and, and our enemies could shoot at us and we'd protect ourselves. Eight silos have been deployed. By the way, um, over all told over the years, since before the ABM treaty was signed in 1972, we spent, it's estimated, about $600 billion on missile defense. Okay? And we don't have a system that works. And I would argue, along with other people, that it's, it's, it, there is no workable missile defense system. But aside from that, the system that exists right now certainly doesn't work. No tests were done for over two years. And then since those, there's been a 50% uh, success rate in the rigged tests that have been done since then. By rigged, I mean, in general, we can hit a missile 50% of the time when we know where it's coming from, where it's launched, and what its trajectory is. So if we're fortunate enough to be informed of these things in advance, in an actual wartime situation, we'll have a 50